My name is Mindy Boxing. I'm the Executive Director for External Affairs on behalf of President Carol Mason and really the entire John Jay College community. Welcome to our college and this beautiful Shiva Gallery. It's really appropriate to hold this forum called Time's Up here at John Jay College and um, where we are dedicated, as many of you know, to all aspects of justice, and now and during the Women's History Month. This is the latest in the Sexual Justice Now series, and at this pivotal point in time, this initiative aims to foster better understanding of American culture surrounding the issues of sexual harassment and assault, including intimate partner violence, and to educate and mobilize the college community and the general public through various projects, presentations, and network events. Our faculty, administrators, students, all had a hand in this initiative, which is semester long, and we applaud all of you for your participation. Please take a moment, yes. Please take a moment to experience the multimedia exhibit here called Violated Bodies, New Languages for Justice and Humanity, which draws attention to the painful issues surrounding domestic violence and its ramifications. And you'll hear a little bit more about the exhibit later on this evening. I have the privilege of introducing a remarkable leader and the pleasure of welcoming her back to John Jay College, Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul, who is the highest ranking female elected official in New York State. She has been a lifelong advocate, really a true fierce advocate for justice for women and for families across the state, fighting for equal rights and opportunity for success. Early on, Lieutenant Governor Hochul joined her mother and aunt in establishing the Kathleen Mary House in 2006, a transitional home for victims of domestic violence. The Lieutenant Governor has worked at all levels of government from town board to Congress, where she represented New York's 26th congressional district in cold western New York, and served on the House Armed Services and Homeland Security Committees. Lieutenant Governor Hochul has championed campaigns for many of the governor's signature legislative priorities, from the Enough is Enough College Sexual Assault Prevention Program, to making college more affordable, to passing paid family leave. She prioritizes being the governor's eyes and ears around the ground as she visits all 62 counties every year and anchors the Regional Economic Development Councils that have invested over $4 billion into more than 4,000 projects around the state. In addition, she chairs the New York State Women's Suffrage Commission, and you might have seen some of the posters celebrating women's suffrage. And the commission celebrates the centennial of women's suffrage in New York State and the central, pro and the central role that New Yorkers played in reaching this milestone and shaping the future of women empowerment. The Lieutenant Governor has called the Me Too movement a seismic cultural shift that's needed to shift the balance of power to keep women from being vulnerable in the workplace. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 77th Lieutenant Governor of the State of New York, Kathy Hochul. Thank you, Mindy, and everyone associated with John Jay for welcoming me back. This is probably my third or fourth visit here because I am so enamored of young people who pursue a, a passion for justice in whatever form it may take, and so you're in the right place. And I'm really happy to be here with this, you this evening, but also, uh, Bill, I want to congratulate you on the incredible exhibit that's surrounding us and forces us to look at uh, individuals and images who, by society standards, have been left in the shadows far too long. So thank you for bringing them out into the light of day through this incredible exhibit. Uh, you're also going to be hearing from some very uh, experienced individuals who are going to give you some great panel discussion, uh, conversation a little bit, but I, I think I'm here to kick this off. And I don't have any necessarily prepared remarks because this is something that I don't need to read a speech about. I can speak to you as someone whose own family has been touched by violence, domestic violence, uh, and there is a reason why I do what I do, and that is that my mother as a child had a very abusive household. 
She had a father who abandoned her and her mother at a very, very young age, at a time two generations ago when there was the stigma was with the child and the mother, not the man who walked out. And so she, it was a very lonely experience for her, and they had no money, and they lived above a garage, and just uh, had a very challenging life together. And the abuse and the violence that she was surrounded by as a child had a profound effect on her. And for someone else, it could have had the effect of not knowing there was a better way to live and seeking out a partner who would do the same thing because she didn't know any better. And so it could have been generational. I could have been third generation. But my mother had a lot of courage and a lot of strength. And despite the adversity she endured, uh, she channeled her life very differently. Her own mother died at the age of 36 when my mother was 16 years old. My mother had to raise three younger siblings. And while she was doing that, she was valedictorian, edited the school newspaper, and volunteered to help immigrant children in the community who were trying to learn the languages. And she ended up living in a trailer at age 18, liberated as the new wife of my father. They thought they had made it when they lived in a 31 foot by 8 foot trailer. That was success to her. She found a way out. That's where I come from. And my mother did not recede into a life that she had known. She propelled herself into a whole different existence. And even without a college degree, she found that even though she had little and we had little growing up, there was always people who had less. And so when I was a freshman at Syracuse University, she decided she's going to go back to school to study social work and start being a voice for victims of domestic violence herself. And this was in the 70s when they were called battered wives. And there was a time when there were so little protections from even law enforcement that when one of her clients, as she learned how to be a social worker and dealt with crisis intervention, her clients would call the police on the phone, call 911 looking for help, and they would come to the door and if the husband answered the door and said, don't worry, officer, everything's OK here, you can leave, they turned around and walked out. Women were captives imprisoned in their own homes. And you say, why didn't they walk out? This was a generation when women didn't have a career. Their career was taking care of the home and the babies and the kids. So where are they supposed to go? That was what was going on in the 70s, 80s. And it pains me to know that it's still going on today. The images we see, and even consideration, which I please hope does not happen, of a high-level advisor in our White House being entertained with possibly coming back despite the photos that emerged of a beaten wife. So I'm pretty much an optimist. I'm not prepared to say no progress has been made because we do now have laws on the books to protect women. There are orders of protection available for women. And there's a whole different attitude that you have, you are now a survivor. You're a survivor as opposed to a victim, which is kind of a mindset you don't want to be in. You don't want to be victimized by this individual. You're a survivor of something. And I think that there's much more in place to support families and victim or survivors of domestic violence. And that's what led my mother after a lifetime of giving to others to, on her 70th birthday, didn't want a party. She wanted to open a home for victims of domestic violence because she saw so many had to flee a hostile situation in the middle of the night and they had nowhere to go. But she also didn't want them to know it was just for a couple of days. She literally took in families for years and their children. And we took over a former funeral home, fixed it up, kind of creepy going down the basement. Uh, just got to admit that. But we painted it, my brothers and sisters and our family painted it and made it into a, a play area for the kids. And we turned the attic into a, a learning lab for women to learn computer skills. And we babysat and took care of this just a few years ago. And this became kind of a family project and a, and a culmination of my mom's commitment to helping people who had less. And it was a full-on family community endeavor. And sadly, we lost my mom four years ago, but uh, we still carry that on. And so I am hopeful. I've seen people who came into that house and who left with a smile because they'd never known how to smile. 
children who didn't know love. And I think what the lesson for my mother was, you can take your circumstance and fall into it and be a victim of it and use it as an excuse. Or you can say, I'm going to be different. I'm going to help myself and ultimately help others. For that to me is why I'm in public service, to use this position as the only statewide state official who's a woman to bring a certain perspective to our government and say, I appreciate what men are doing and we do need men at our sides many times to open doors and mentor and assist. But I also know that women can stand up for themselves now and we need to feel empowered ourselves now. And that is what I believe has happened in the last couple of years. I think if there's any upside, and I search hard for this, to, I will say Hillary's loss, because I can't say his win. Uh, I'm really adjusting, I'm trying to handle this. Uh, but the only upside is it bonded people together, people of good conscience, women but also enlightened men who stood with them, just as men stood with women in 1848. Look at the posters out there. At Seneca Falls, when women were saying, back then they had had enough of being treated as a piece of property of their husbands, and the fact that they had no ability to vote or have any say over their lives or their leaders. And there were men in those rooms helping them as well. So I will never say that men don't have a role, they have a key role. But I wanna make sure that women today know that finally there's an opportunity to have their voices lifted out of the shadows and out of the darkness. And I believe that the election in 2016 and the marches in Washington and New York City made people finally feel they had control, that they didn't have to be victims, that when women stand together, they can accomplish so much. And in state government, we are championing so many issues to help women and families on a so many fronts, I cannot tell you how many. We work on domestic violence. We work on trying to have tougher gun laws, even though New York State has the toughest gun laws in the nation that the governor was able to get through after the Sandy Hook massacre. Are you proud of that? But also we realize that we can still do more. The governor is now pushing for a 10-day waiting period, a cooling off period instead of three days before someone is allowed to purchase a gun. The governor also realizes that half of all female murder victims, half, are killed by someone that they're present or past intimate partners with. And so having guns in the home of someone who has a protective order against them puts a woman at risk, puts the children at risk. So we're also fighting to make sure that on top of the laws we have that we can protect women by saying, if there is an order of protection, the guns go. Okay, We can adjudicate this later, but I'd rather be in a court arguing this than in a funeral home regretting that we didn't take care of this early enough. That's the sense of urgency that we're bringing to this cause as well. And so there's so many other areas, whether it's pay equity, where women still don't make enough as men, make, make the same as men, particularly women of color, women... White women make 89 cents on the dollar in New York State, the highest in the nation. I personally think they're worth more in many ways. They should make a dollar fifty more. Uh, but black women, 66 cents on the dollar. Latinas, 54, 53 percent, or 53 cents on the dollar. We have a ways to go. But you live in a state and you live in a city that is progressive, that champions these causes, that we lean hard into them, even though in other parts of our state, other parts of our nation, they're not politically popular. That doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, you have to do what's right. And there is only one right way. And I believe that the Me Too movement and Time Out and efforts like you've done here today, having this symposium, this seminar for the whole semester, finding different mediums and speakers and others to just challenge this generation because I believe that the students of today, the college students, but also your new partners in changing the world, the high school students and the middle school students who now have come out and feeling the power of political engagement. 
I have never been more optimistic about the future of this country than I am right now. I grew up during Watergate. I grew up when a president left in disgrace. I grew up after the Vietnam War ripped our country apart, and I was protesting it with a black armband in fifth grade. I have never been more optimistic because your generation and the one that's right behind you, the kids that are right behind you, are not going to put up with this stuff anymore. They're not going to take it anymore. And I'm so excited about that. I am excited about harnessing social media as an instrument to get people together, the messaging that can occur, and the ability to have your voices heard in all the corridors of power. That's the gift that you have been given by the movements that are shaking and, sh shaking and shaping our time. And so I'll close by saying this. As you saw that exhibit when you walked in here, celebrating women's suffrage, November 6, 2017 was the 100th anniversary of the passage of women winning the right to vote after 70 years, 70 years since Seneca Falls it took. And so we celebrated big party here in New York City. We lit up the Freedom Tower. We lit up Empire State Building. We lit up bridges. We lit up Niagara Falls on the other side of the state in the color of purple. Purple is the color of suffrage. And I know when I tell the stories of the struggles of those audacious, bold, sometimes crazy women who never gave up, they marched. They were ostracized by society, by their own families. They were arrested. Alice Paul was thrown into an insane asylum because they thought she was so crazy to have the idea to vote. Carolyn Maloney's husband's family member. <laughs> Carolyn Maloney was my roommate in Congress. There's great stories, stories of resilience, stories of never giving up, no matter how long it took. And so I think back when this journey started, I'm in charge of celebrating this statewide. I have been living under this stress of thinking 100 years from now, when they celebrate the bicentennial of women winning the right to vote here in our home state, the birthplace of the women's rights movement, what will they say about our time? How will we measure up in 2017 and 18 and 19 and 20, all the way till the centennial of the rest of the country caught up with us in allowing women the right to vote? What are they going to say about us? I don't want to just have the torch passed to me and passed on to the next generation we have a moral responsibility to make sure that torch glows even brighter. We have to have a legacy ourselves. And that is the beauty of the march for our lives. That is the beauty of Black Lives Matter. That is the beauty of the Me Too movement. Because people today are feeling the power to change culture, society, government, and ultimately, this will result in people looking back 100 years and say, that's when it all changed. That's when women were liberated once and for all. It was not the right to vote. It was society's final respect to treat women as equals in every walk of life. You now have the torch. I just handed it to you. Make it glow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor. Let's give her another round of applause. What a great message. Okay. So um, we are pleased to welcome another trailblazer. And we are so fortunate this evening. We're celebrating um, in women empowerment and um, really the, the spirit of engagement. And we are fortunate to have another trailblazer, as I mentioned, another champion and fierce advocate for, ju for justice. It is my honor to introduce Commissioner Malalis. Kamelin P. Malalis is the chair and the commissioner of the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Throughout her career, Commissioner Malalis has been a fierce advocate for justice, as I mentioned. And you see that phrase, that mission, around our halls. Promoting diversity and inclusion and preventing and prosecuting discrimination and intolerance. 
She was a partner at Odom and Golden LLP, where she co-founded and co-chaired the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Workplace Rights Practice Group. There, she successfully represented employees in negotiations, litigation, and agency proceedings involving sexual harassment, retaliation, and discrimination based on race, national origin, sex, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, age, pregnancy, disability, and religion. She is really the true number here. Since assuming the role as chair of the commission in 2015, she has revitalized the agency, making it a venue for justice for all New Yorkers through increased enforcement, education, and outreach, and training throughout the workplace to prevent discrimination in New York City. Under her leadership, the commission has implemented guidelines and orders regarding gender identity and gender expression protections to provide explicit examples to employers, landlords, business owners, and the general public on what the city considers discrimination under the law, and we will not tolerate it. Please join me in welcoming the commissioner to the podium to offer opening remarks. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Carmelyn P. Malalas, and I am the Commissioner and Chair for the New York City Commission on Human Rights. I want to first say thank you so much to John Jay for having me here today. Um, it's kind of a one-year anniversary. I think I, I'm at John Jay now. This is my second March being here in a row. Uh, the Commission was here just about a year ago when we had uh, put on our Women's Rights Forum um, about a year ago, and we entitled that forum, you know, our, our identities, our communities, our rights. It was, it was an inspirational day where we were pulling together women from different communities uh, to talk about their experiences of discrimination and harassment in the city, and to talk about how we uh, could be facing some of these challenges together and united in things as they were going forward. It was after the Women's March, um, but of course, it was before everything that we're hearing coming out now, the reemergence of the Me Too movement uh, and the emergence of the Time's Up movement. So it seems that we are, we're coming together in March, uh, one year after a watershed movement because of the Women's March, and then this year, because of this incredible movement that we are seeing where women are being undaunted in sharing their experiences and their narratives of sexual harassment and discrimination across workplaces. So I'm, I'm honored to be here tonight, thank you. So for those of you that don't know, the Commission on Human Rights is the city agency, we're a government agency, and we are charged with enforcing the city's very broad and very protective anti-discrimination and anti-harassment protections. We are considered to have you know, one of the broadest most protective civil rights, human rights laws across the country. Uh, one of those reasons is because we have 24 categories of protection, which for civil rights or human rights related laws is pretty great. I was at a conference in Seattle a few months back with other human rights related agencies, and when they heard that we had so many categories of protection, so many ways in which we protect people in housing and employment, and in places of public accommodation and, and on the street or in transit stations, people were pretty impressed. Um, and to hear that we also have the strong mandate within our law to make sure that we're using the law to its fullest potential to really root out and remedy discrimination was also pretty important, pretty uh, uh, unprecedented for some of the, the agencies that were represented there. You know, in the last three years that I've had the privilege of heading the Commission on Human Rights, it's been part of our priority, part of our goals, to be reaching out to some of the city's most vulnerable, most un underrepresented, most unreached out to communities. Folks that have generally felt, perhaps, that they couldn't come forward for government protections or resources. Maybe these are communities that have been over-policed, overly surveilled, communities that have not felt the comfort or the relationship with government to come forward even when they probably needed the protections of government the most. 
So we've sought to really also invest our time into combating discrimination and harassment where we know that it also happens too frequently and yet is unnoticed. Um, and you know, it's, it's interesting, you're, you're having this forum today, you have two women in government opening uh, today's program. You know, you have somebody who is uh, one of the highest levels in state government, somebody who's a head of agency in a New York City government agency. You have folks who have reached the highest levels in city council and have reached top tiers of industries and universities and other sectors. And yet, we are still grossly underrepresented in leadership across all sectors. And it's a lack of women in leadership in true positions of power that I think has also facilitated and contributed to the abuse of power by others that so often leave women victimized or harassed, ostracized and isolated, and have prevented them from advancing in their careers or from escaping oppressive and often unsafe working conditions, perpetrating a very intentional cycle that serves people in power. While sexual harassment in the workplace is not a new phenomenon, we are nationally experiencing a reckoning with regards to this all too common human rights abuse. And it's important that we call it out for what it is. It is a human rights abuse. And we owe deep thanks to the many women and men and non-binary people that have been coming out in the last few months, bravely coming forward at great personal and much professional risk to share their stories of sexual harassment and assault across their industries. The wave of people breaking their silence, it's been steady and it's been unrelenting. And it's my hoping that the narratives continue, that people continue to tell their stories and share how their experiences matter and why this is a topic that should be addressed. The power structures that have existed for so long to allow this behavior to continue for in some cases decades, to silence victims, to shame victims, to make victims believe they are powerless, those structures are crumbling upon us and we have to help them crumble. Sexual harassment is being exposed for what it is, an abuse of power and privilege, period. And in many of these instances, they're being exposed with women leading the way. And we know that while the entertainment industry has been leading the headlines where we see famous people or celebrities leading the headlines in this space, we also know that it's really low wage workers, women of color, immigrant workers, domestic workers, LGBTQ workers that experience sexual harassment at extremely high rates and in fact are probably more vulnerable to harassment because of their intersections of racism and classism and homophobia and transphobia. And it makes it even harder for them to assert their rights, protect themselves and achieve justice. So on December 6, 2017, a few months back, the commission held the city's first ever hearing on sexual harassment in the workplace. This was the first hearing since the commission over 40 years ago held a public hearing on gender discrimination. And we held this hearing because we wanted to invite representatives from these different industries, from construction, from utilities, from domestic work, from tech from other sectors whose narratives and whose voices had not been reaching the media or social media. We wanted to make sure their narratives were being told. And we heard the stories of brave trailblazing women who were piercing through in these male dominated industries and other industries. We heard about triggering details of harassment and toxic cultures, supervisors who wouldn't take workers complaints seriously co-workers who would retaliate against women for trying to claim, to put out their claims and tell their stories. And we'll be publishing a report this spring that includes a lot of our recommendations and our findings from that hearing and from the other testimony that people submitted afterwards. So I, I hope that folks will go to our website and take a look uh, when that report does come out. Now, the commission was specifically created as a venue for all New Yorkers, regardless 
of how rich or poor or whatever their resources are. So that New Yorkers without resources, who don't have money, who don't have the types of ability to pay for filings in court or, or expensive lawyers, so their stories and their types of discrimination could also be remedied. And that's why we've increasingly devoted resources to, sh to ensure that women and everyone else in New York City knows that they're protected from discrimination and harassment and has resources at our agency. We've significantly increased our enforcement efforts to protect women and also to address gender-based discrimination. And if you look at just at the past year in 2017, gender discrimination actually accounted for a third of all claims at the Commission on Human Rights. And most of those claims were actually in the area of uh, employment. Safety from sexual harassment, freedom from discrimination, that shouldn't belong to just a wealthy few who could afford it, who could afford justice. All of us are deserving of it. You're deserving of it. And we want to make sure at the commission that folks are able to attain it. So please call us. And that's why no one has to pay a filing fee. No one has to have a lawyer. No one has to come in with money in order to file at our agency. We know that people don't always feel comfortable calling the government or reporting sexual harassment. But I want you to know that the commission can still help you. We can still initiate investigations on behalf of the city where people are feeling, you know what, I'm already vulnerable. I don't want to put my name on a complaint. Call 311, ask for human rights, call us directly at 718-722-3131. We need folks to stand up and call us so we can address this where it happens. Every woman, every person that's living or working in New York City deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. And we're using every tool at our disposal to make sure that happens. I also want to take a moment to note that, you know, we, we have important involvement from our business communities our, and our employers. Because I think true impact, we have to really change behavior, right? We don't want to just address things when they happen. We want to make sure that we're preventing these things from happening in order to truly eradicate sexual harassment. And even if you look at how quickly we put together our hearing in December, some of the stories, the Me Too resurgence stories started coming in, uh, in October and we put together a hearing in December. And we put it together so quickly because employers and businesses were reaching out to us and they were saying, we don't want to be a headline. So what should we be doing differently? How can we help? What should we be doing? And it's important to remind them and everyone that this is not just a moment, it's indeed a movement. And it's a movement with a call to action, right? What are folks doing when they're witnessing sexual harassment, when they see it happen? What are the bystanders doing? Who else could be reporting abuses of power? What are businesses doing to change their policies? Think about that. Start those discussions in your workplaces. Start those conversations in your communities. Unfortunately, I'll be stepping out soon because I have another engagement uh, uptown, uh, and I'm very sorry to be missing the panel discussion. I know that on the panel discussion, there will be uh, representatives from the arts and from academia. And the reality is that government needs to hear from you. We need to learn from your experiences. You need to be telling us what to do because we serve you. Uh, so I'm sad to be missing it. But I want you to please keep in contact. Reach out to the Commission on Human Rights. All of my staff know that they have the, the direction from me that when they get calls from the public, they have to return them. Because I invite folks to call me if you don't get a call back. And no one on my staff wants to get that call from me. <laughs> so you know, keep your voices loud. Keep voicing your narratives. Report things to the Commission on Human Rights. Keep inviting us to events like this, but please share your experiences because they really matter. Thanks so much. Another round of applause for the Commissioner and the Commission. So now I have the pleasure of inviting up to the podium two great colleagues, um, Barbara Cassidy, and William Pengburn, 
who um, will talk a little bit about the initiative as well as the exhibit before we bring on the panel. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Commissioner, for that wonderful speech. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, sex Sexual Justice Now is this semester-long initiative, if you're not familiar with it. Um, we're having various events, including film, panels, talks, and theater, and art. Um, our next coming events, we're having an event on April 12th, which is the Theater of, of War. Um, they're doing a, a, a part of Streetcar Named Desire, and they do an audience interaction type of thing, and it's all about domestic violence. Um, and then we have the Seeing Rape Plays in May, May 8th, 9th, and 10th, and we hope you can join us for those plays. Um, now I would like to introduce Bill Pangburn, Peng Burn, sorry, the director of all the galleries at John Jay. Tell us a little bit about this exhibit. Thank you. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, I'm often asked, why art at John Jay? Why do we have galleries? You're the cop school, right? Um, so at first, when I was a little nonplussed when I first heard that question, and didn't know quite what to say, but I think Looking around tonight, the answer is right here. You all are here tonight. And this is what we're about. We're about, as a college, we're about exploring the many dimensions of justice. In the galleries, we're about exploring the many dimensions of justice, but through the visual arts. And we reach our greatest potential when we can combine the two. When we have a conference like this within our walls of the gallery. So it's quite an honor, and I'm very grateful that you all have come here. This exhibit dovetails perfectly with this year-long initiative. It's called um, New Languages for Justice and Humanity, Violated Bodies, New Languages for Justice and Humanity, and it's about domestic violence. It's seven different artists from all over the world, actually. Uh, Brazil, Australia, Italy, and the United States that are addressing questions of domestic violence. You have Alessandro Palombo, who's an Italian artist and deals with images from the media, be it superstars, Emma Watson, Madonna, Kim Kardashian, and what happens in these larger-than-life larger figures when their image is disrupted through bruises and cuts and battering? Or what happens to Snow White or Olive Oil when he does the same? Or you have Simone Kesselman, who's the Brazilian representative, who through poetry and elegance, and haunting elegance at that, presents us a tale or a vision of what it's like to be a child and suffer from abuse. Debbie Hahn, one of the American artists, we have one picture here and there's one picture hidden by the step and repeat um, for a good cause, um, addresses issues of objectification and race and images of beauty and Western culture and does it quite sophisticatedly, I think, in the way she blends the statue heads that are Greco-Roman, our classical heritage, with the skin and the real life figures the existing, of existing women. Belinda Mason and Denise Beckham are part of a project out of Australia called the Blur Project. This video is also part of it. It's turned off tonight for the conference uh, by Dieter Kinnearum. And they work with women who've been abused. And their goal and intent is through established languages, such as the documentary photograph, or a video expose, or a commercial type representation, to speak to the individuality and the integrity of these individual women. And finally, in the room behind here, and I'll turn this on later, when you all have a chance to get up and explore the exhibit, is an installation by Kat Del, Del Buono, an American artist as well, that's quite riveting. And it's the story of nine women and what they suffered when they were abused. So I think it became clear to me. I was asked that question, why art at John Jay? I was asked that question by a former commissioner of police when we had an exhibit of police photography. And I was a little nonplussed. I happened to have two students with me, and they could answer the question much more fluently than I could at the time. But I think tonight is perfect. The answer is right here. As I said, it's right here with you all. It's right here with the exhibit that we have. So thank you for coming, and I hope you'll come back to see us many, many more times. Thank you. 
So I'm just um, going to read the bios for this great panel that we have. Um, so we'll start with Marin Ireland is a stage, film, and television actress. She won the 2009 Theatre World Award and was nominated for a 2009 Tony Award for Best Performance by a Featured Actress in a Play for her performance in Reasons to be Pretty. She currently stars on the Amazon show Sneaky Pete. She and attorney Norman Siegel have launched a pilot mediation program to help resolve <coughs> sexual harassment issues in the theater community. Welcome, Marin. Um, Byron Hurt is an award-winning documentary filmmaker, lecturer, published writer, and anti-sexist advocate, activist. Hurt is the former host of the Emmy-nominated Emmy series Real Works by Byron Hurt. His documentary, Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and broadcast on the PBS series Independent Lens. He's also an adjunct professor at Columbia University in the Journalism School in the documentary program, and a consultant for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Forward Promise Initiative, a storytelling project for boys and young men of color. This former Northwestern University football quarterback was a founding member of the Mentors in Violence program, MVP, the leading college-based rape and domestic violence prevention initiative for college and professional athletics. Hurt also served as an associate director of the first gender violence prevention program in the US Marine Corps. Now we'll go to Wendy. Wendy Murphy, for more than 15 years, has served as an adjunct professor of sexual violence law at New England Law Boston, where she also co-directs the Women's and Children's Advocacy Project under the Center for Law and Social Responsibility. A former visiting scholar at Harvard Law School, Wendy prosecuted child abuse and sex crimes cases for many years. In 1992, she founded the first organization in the nation to provide pro bono legal services to crime victims. Wendy is an impact litigator whose work in state and federal courts has changed the law to better protect the constitutional and civil rights of victimized women and children. Wendy writes and lectures widely on the constitutional and civil rights of women and children and criminal justice policy. She is a contributing, contributing editor for the Sexual Assault Report and writes a regular column for the Patriot Ledger. Wendy has published numerous scholarly articles, including a landmark law review article explaining the legal relationship between sexual assault on campus and Title IX. Stephanie Russell Kraft is a Brooklyn-based freelance reporter covering the intersections of gender, law, religion, and the military. She has written for the New Republic, The Nation, Task and Purpose, and Religion Dispatches, among others, and is a regular contributing reporter for Bloomberg Law. Since 2016, she has been a board member of WAM NYC, the New York City chapter of Women, Action, and the Media, a national nonprofit dedicated to gender justice in the media. Shauna Trinch, PhD, is a linguist, linguistic anthropologist and a faculty member at John Jay College, CUNY, and in the Department of Anthropology. Shauna does research on topics ranging from rape, intimate partner violence, and narrative to Brooklyn's gentrification, redevelopment, and eminent domain. Shauna has published several articles on gender-related violence in leading journals. Her first book, Latina's Narratives of Domestic Abuse, Discrepant Versions of Violence, examines how women report intimate violence in different so so socio-legal settings. She is also completing a book entitled What the Signs Say, forthcoming of Vanderbilt, with Ed Snyder that examines how dominant culture establishes social hierarchy in gentrifying Brooklyn through storefront signs. She lectures on these topics in the US and in Europe. She's the co-founder of the Seeing Rape Theater Project at John Jay. Finally, our moderator, Dr. Chitra Raghavan, is a professor of psychology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and acting director of the Forensic Mental Health Program. Dr. Raghavan conducts research in interpersonal violence and exploitation and the resulting traumatic outcomes. She has over 40 publications, two books, and 100 conference presentations, all of which were written collaboratively with students. Yay. 
She is a practicing psychologist and has been deemed an expert by the courts. Her most current research project focuses on how to measure and document invisible violence, invisible violence, across sexual violence, sex trafficking, and domestic violence contexts. She believes strongly that all interpersonal violence, exploitation, research should directly contribute to improving social justice or else is in itself exploitation. Yeah. Thank you, welcome these guys. <laughs> What we're going to do, folks, is I, I, we're going to um, have a little discussion with the panelists, and then we're going to open it to the floor. So I'm, we have till 7.30, maybe a little later, so I'm going to go ahead and start so we can have a rich, colorful discussion. Um, the first question I have is for Wendy Murphy. Is Me Too a moment or a movement? <laughs> I should have said don't, uh, don't call on me first because I'm always the skunk at the garden party. Um, and I hate, I just hate being the person that keeps saying this at these sorts of events, but in my opinion, it is um, um, a moment and not remotely close to a movement. And I say that not only because I've grown cynical over the years, but because I've watched what was organically a really important movement um, turn into what I think is... Uh, a kind of hijacked, non-feminist based, I don't know what, you know, media grab. I, I, let me explain why. The folks who started Me Too, hashtag Me Too, I think were really sincere in their effort to use social media to give voice to the problem that is and always has been quite invisible. Um, but then, um, especially with regard to the Time's Up movement, what I saw happening was a kind of uh, hijacking and a uh, gathering of that energy. Um, and that happens sometimes. For those of you who studied social activism and social movements, you know that when there's an arc and people are bubbling up and they're angry and they're marching uh, and screaming and complaining and angry, uh, the forces of power come in to disperse that and they um, do it in a variety of different ways. They throw money around, um, you know, divide and conquer, um, come up with all kinds of ways to deflate that energy. And I saw that with Time's Up in a couple of different ways. And, and you know, take this for, from my perspective as somebody who's seeing things from a very different perspective than on the, on the ground. I love the fact that people are speaking out. I think it's important. But I worry more about systems and the government and uh, long-term change, and my concern is that virtually all of this conversation that's being spearheaded largely by the media, um, always make, which by the way always makes me suspicious, um, but none of the people with power are talking about the Equal Rights Amendment. That, and that's important. Um, the, 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 you know, the space between equality and inequality is where violence happens with impunity. Violence against women happens with impunity. And unless you're closing that gap, nothing else matters, nothing. So what happened when Oprah went on the Golden Globes and all these other um, you know, famous people with power and influence uh, spoke on the world stage about the problem and framed it as time's up rather than, um, in my opinion, paying homage to what was an organic movement as hashtag me too. Uh, not one of them mentioned the Equal Rights Amendment, not one of them framed violence against women as a civil rights issue. Not one of them. And if you can't call, use your, your power to call attention to the fact that violence against women is the product of structured, constitutionally mandated inequality and subjugation, if you can't say that first, then what you're doing is using your power to legitimize the very violence you're complaining about. And I heard that deafening silence from Oprah Winfrey, from Ashley Judd, from all the people that we're now all supposed to be um, inspired by, they were silent. Unless we're talking about equality first, we're not talking about the real issue. So that's why I call it a moment, not a movement. Um, the dispersion of money, I think I just have to quickly comment on the fact that Time's Up not only uh, changed the power of Me Too, in my opinion, hijacked it in a bit, uh, in a little bit of a way, but also um, 
gathered funds. As you may know, millions of dollars were given to the Time's Up movement, which was then handed to the National Women's Law Center. The National Women's Law Center is widely perceived as the leading women's rights organization in this country, and that is not correct. They do not advocate for the ERA. They do not advocate for equality under civil rights laws in education. They do not advocate for the equal enforcement of Title IX on par with Title VI, which is the exact same thing except it covers race and national origin. They filed, they are involved in a lawsuit that was filed against Betsy DeVos in January out in California. And they asked for the National Women's Law Center, Serve Justice, um, um, what was the other group? Um, the groups that filed, I can't even remember, the groups that filed against Betsy DeVos in California federal court just a couple of months ago asked the court to enforce second class treatment of women under civil rights laws, under Title IX on campus. They asked for second class treatment. And then they want you to celebrate that. Well, they're the ones, the National Women's Law Center, the ones that just got millions of dollars from the Time's Up movement. Think about that. Millions of dollars going to an organization that is asking the courts for second class treatment. Thank but, you. Yeah, oh, I was going to no. say, by contrast, I filed a lawsuit against Betsy DeVos in October where I asked for first class treatment. <laughs> and yeah, and I said that, that you have no choice. You have no choice but to treat race, gender, national origin, and so forth the same because that's what civil rights laws say. That's what civil rights laws say. So I just want to, I hope I don't give you a horrible feeling about the work we're all doing and the hopefulness we should all be feeling about, especially the Me Too movement, but I wanted to make you at least suspicious of what you're hearing so that you can be critical consumers of information, critical consumers of propaganda, whether it comes to you through your social media or a seemingly legitimate news source. Be critical consumers of the information you're getting about this movement so that you don't become a pawn. That's what I really, the message I wanted to impart. Thank you. I feel very hopeful. Um, we have media people at the table, and so some of what you were saying was with both Byron Hurt. May, may I call you a media person? Is that correct? Yeah, That's correct. Course, yeah. And we have a media. So I want to sort of ask the two media people if you want to comment on some of what Wendy said, but also the idea that you know what can the media do to take this moment and bring it into something more responsible, something that's sustainable. Maybe um, who'd like to go first? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll defer. Okay. Is this all? Okay. That's a really difficult question. Um, I want to start by saying I, I don't disagree with you on a lot of what you said. Um, part of the thing that I see as someone, I'm a freelancer also, so I'm not working within the structure of just one news organization, but I definitely see the way in which um, sort of journalists and media organizations kind of, you know, move along with whatever is sort of trending and that it's sort of like a thing that feeds itself because they're sort of deciding that but also following each other. And part of what the, the problems that I've seen, you know, if we're talking about Me Too as a moment, not a movement, is that I've started hearing editors saying like, oh, we need to find the Weinstein of X industry. Or we need to, you know, like, what's like Me Too conduct? I'm like, first of all, I don't know what Me Too conduct means. It's not like, there's no like one set of things that someone does that is a Me Too thing that they do. Me Too is like someone on the other side saying that, you know, they've had an experience where someone violated their consent. Um, and the idea of like everyone, every reporter, and this isn't, this isn't everyone, but you know, the idea of chasing after the wine scene of X industry is sort of thinking of it, in my opinion, in the wrong way, because you're sort of treating it as these like outliers and they're looking for the most extreme examples of conduct and behavior or misconduct that is sort of rooted in the whole structure of our society and gender expectations and gender norms, you know, on basically all of like the entire structure that you're talking about and the fact that women are still second class citizens and the fact that we still don't really address the fact that domestic violence is such a huge problem in this country. All, you know, all of these things, the way that women aren't represented in most leadership positions that, as the commissioner was saying earlier, um, just, you know, the, the whole range of behaviors uh, that, that women encounter um, the structures, I think all of those are important to address. And sometimes I think journalists who are also under pressure to find stories that sort of like fit into story packages and like fit neat headlines, and that's a pressure that we're under, it sort of like forces us into 
you know, finding these stories that don't necessarily connect everything to bigger cultural issues. And it's really hard. I've tried doing reporting. Uh, I was reporting on uh, sexual misconduct in the military and trying to show in my reporting that, you know, assault and harassment is sort of all across this continuum that we, begins with maybe just like off-color jokes. And it's really hard to report on like a microaggression or the, on a structure. It's really hard to like write it down in a way that someone's gonna understand. It's a lot easier to say, hey, this guy did this horrific thing and had this button under his desk and was showing his penis to people at work. And it's like, wow, that's really extreme behavior. But somehow, as journalists, we need to figure out how to cover that whole spectrum and these systems and address these structural inequalities. I hope that answers the question. To, to me, beautifully. Um, which, Shana, I'd like to kind of keep continuing with this discussion. I know you study um, language and how you study the way people tell rape stories, for example. How can your work help inform professionals, um, both journalists and you know, judges, uh, other academics in the field? How can your work continue the moment to become a better part of a movement? <clears throat> so as, as a linguist, um, for me, language is everything. It, it not only represents our world, it, it totally creates it. I mean, the way that we talk about things constructs the perceptions. Um, and I feel really lucky that I get to teach. I get to help students deconstruct some of these narratives that are, are going around. I mean, the, the responses to Me Too were, to me, you know, Steven Spielberg, all these people who were responding, like taking them into the classroom and saying to students, what rape <coughs> myths are being upheld here? Um, because this is kind of the issues that you're talking about. Like, what is the architecture in culture, right? The kind of soup to nuts that allows Matt Lauer to go on and on and on, um, and nobody says anything, right? Uh, and, you know, he, I, I always think about that one instance where he would go into the uh, this was reported by someone. Um, he would go into the office and, and play this game that like children play in seventh and eighth grade where they would say, you know, uh, Sean or Trinch, um, kill, sleep with, but that wasn't the word that they used, or um, what was Mary. it? Mary, right? And I just wondered, I was like, and which was Savannah Guthrie? She was Mary. Like, you can just figure it out, right? That's why she and Matt were friends, because, so Savannah also has a hand in this, I believe, right? Because she allows this to be played, this game to be played. She's the good girl in the office, and, you know, that's a nice place, nicer place to be than the, the others. And so, you know, we, we are all, um, complicitous in this, and we all have to figure out how to deconstruct these narratives and where to, uh, where to make that intervention when we can. Um, and I, I also think that you know, we, we need to think about things all the time like white supremacy, not just the patriarchy, but white supremacy, because we did see in this last election, this no, you know, November 6, 2017 is a big hallmark um, for suffrage, but we just voted someone into the White House. Um, and, and white women did that. And so we need to ask, like, what, what are white women voting for when they're voting for someone like that? And it's, it looks, by all analyses, to be white supremacy, right? And so I think that these things are very connected, and I think that it is our job to start deconstructing them all the time, even as exhausting as it is being the skunk at the party <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Um, that's wonderful. You know, one of the things we've all struggled with is, is what is, is it to be complicit? Are we actively complicit? Are we indirectly complicit? By being silent, are we being complicit? When we speak up all the time, do people get sick of us? And, and some of the work you've done, Byron, is exactly the opposite. You've spent a lot of time working with boys and men on the topic of sexual violence prevention. Um, what are the ways you've seen that men, for example, absolve themselves of responsibility, so are making themselves complicit, but by distancing and sort of saying, well, you know, I didn't do it, so what has it got to do with me? Well, thank you very much, that's a good question. Um, so I have a very interesting life in that I'm both a documentary filmmaker who makes films that focus on manhood and masculinity, but also um, I am an activist in that I go out and I speak to as many boys and men all over the country and in various parts of the world about the culture of masculinity and what boys and men can do to be a part of the solution as opposed to being a part of the problem and to be proactive bystanders as opposed to being complicit in the face of um, sexism and misogyny and patriarchy and um, you know all of the things that, that you mentioned. 
And you know, the, I think the, the bottom line is that, um, first of all, I, I agree that, that addressing systems of inequality <clears throat> as opposed to isolated acts, so individual acts of um, sexual violence or physical violence um, is absolutely necessary in addressing boys and men. I think that um, a lot of young boys and men, regardless of race, class, culture, or education, tem tend to believe just like the, in, in many ways the way that the media treats uh, mass shootings or mass shooters as lone individual mm -hmm. um, perpetrators, right? Uh, m most men tend to view sexual violence or physical violence as individual crimes that were committed by bad men as opposed to linking them to larger systems, right? A system of abuse or a culture of masculinity or a culture of patriarchy that allows for uh, so much sexual violence to take place in this country and around the world. And so part of what I do is to try and have conversations with boys and men about that and connect dots, help them to see that these are not just individual acts, but this is part of a much larger social system and cultural system and political system that enables men to act violently oh, and not yeah. have be held accountable for their actions because of male privilege and patriarchy. Absolutely. You know, it's m many years ago, and in a minute, this will be clear while I'm telling you, starting a story with many years ago, I was invited to Rikers to do a domestic violence training for um, men who were exiting the system. So the training never happened because while I was explaining to the correctional officers what I was going to do, I noticed the temperature of the room really go up. And everybody started to look down, look at each other, and it wasn't working at all. It was supposed to be five or six hours while they would get the pilot. So I stopped and I said, what's, what's wrong? What's going on? And one of the correction officers said, you know, it's not like my life is easy. My boyfriend hits me, and but what, what support do I get from the, the prison? I get nothing. I'm one of the ones who stayed out of prison, but I get no support. So the whole thing, it, it was in some ways a disaster, in some ways it was a success. And so I spent the rest of the day talking to the correctional officers about how hard their lives were. And some of the anger was, why do I have to be a leader when I get so little? And I want to say that because everybody at this table leads, but you know, maybe they may not always get support from close corners or distant corners, and they're taken for granted as being so strong that they don't need affection or they don't need validation or that they don't make mistakes or that they're just superhuman. And so uh, later, after, or now, whenever, thank them because the work that they do is so lonely. And, it's yes, it, and is. it is so lonely. And you don't make a lot of friends. You make a hell of a lot of enemies. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so just later on, come up to these wonderful people and thank them. Um, in that same line, I want to go, this is a question for anybody, but um, directed maybe a little bit at Stephanie. So, so we know there's a lot of sexism in different industries. Um, how does the movement affect the journalism industry, right? You want, people are writing about gender, but how do the gender dynamics in the newsroom affect what stories are told or impact what stories are told? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, journalism, uh, like any other facet of our society, is just full of people that are subject to the same you know, cultural norms. We've got the same power structures. Uh, we. The whole, and there's a lot of discussion about it. I don't know if I have an answer. The, the problem is like too many newsrooms are still run by you know, white men. And the, like if every year there's a couple different organizations that put out um, sort of like the counts of sort of representation of women and people of color, uh, people with disabilities, uh, et cetera, in the newsroom. And it's like, there's been progress, but there's still really problematic and maybe even the problem is it's like also like a, the hierarchy matters too. So you might end up with like a lot of reporters who are women, people of color, women of color, but then like the editors are still white men and the, and the publishers are still white men. And that's always going to impact like what the report, you know, the, the reporters can still come at their work with their perspective. And I think, you know, we're going to get the best media coverage when we have the most diverse um, group of people doing the actual covering of, of events and, and cultural problems. But if you're still sort of constrained by who's above you and like what direction you're allowed to take a story in that, that matters. So I don't know what the, the original question was why. What do we <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, you answered it, but you know, sort of the idea, what are the gen how are the gender dynamics impacting the story, since a little bit about what you're saying yeah. and what you're saying, the structure is frozen, so it doesn't well, matter. Yeah, the, it, yeah, it impacts mm -hmm. the stories that are told, and then also, I mean, we've heard so many stories, this is across so many industries, of people who leave industries entirely because they're so fed up with dealing whatever, you know, sexual dynamics. And so I'm sure there are a lot of women reporters that just like aren't in journalism any, anymore because they sort of got tired of it at, or they, you know, were, they were harassed at work and no one believed them. And that's also a huge problem. Thank you. Um, Maureen, I know you've, you've been doing some really important work um, in theater. Maybe you could take a little time and tell, tell the audience the work that you've been doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, about three years ago, uh, based on it, because of a personal experience that I had um, on a job, I discovered that the Actors' Equity Association, the union for theater actors and stage managers here in the city and across the country, um, there were some loopholes in terms of how they could actually help their uh, members. Um, and they're pretty glaring, so I... <laughs> gathered some sort of town hall meetings together with people in, in town and tried to see if, uh, how, what people thought about it, what people thought we should do about it. And um, I tried to get in touch with people high up in the union and three years ago I was told that this was not uh, an issue, um, <laughs> not a problem. Um, so three years ago this was a lot harder uh, to get some change to happen and eventually I ultimately had to go to the Times and um, get an article there talking about this stuff and asking for changes and then I could meet with people at Actors' Equity and since then we've been doing a lot of very slow, painstaking work to try to figure out some things to do. One of the things that has been most difficult is finding some other options for people who are in trouble um, because as we know, <laughs> there's a really wide range of experiences people have that fall under this umbrella and uh, what I was finding is that there's a really, a really big lack of um, options for people who are actually interested in uh, salvaging a working relationship um, before it has gotten past that point. And that nobody really knows how to have these kinds of conversations with each other to work through something like this in a moment of, where education might be possible for somebody who's saying things they shouldn't say or uh, behaving in a certain way that makes people feel uncomfortable and nobody really knew how to address these things. So uh, Norman Siegel, this lawyer that I was working with, um, we just finally decided to do it ourselves and make a mediation option available to anybody in the arts here in the city, um, which our hope is that especially in positions of administrative power like artistic directors or directors of a show, uh, that that kind of thing really useful for them because uh, ultimately what we're dealing with is people where it's a very short period of time and everybody involved is invested financially in that experience going really well. So people would most likely just try to wait it out. And then you have people who uh, are walking around the city trying to figure out how to avoid people or take care of it themselves in their personal life somehow, but really just having these uh, personal uh, wounds that they're carrying around with them for the rest of their uh, career. So that's sort of what we started with a few years ago. It's amazing. Um, Maureen, what do you wish people understood about the particularities of the kind of work you do? And I ask it because so much of what's in the media is about film, is about acting, is about entertainment. But I realize that, you know, most of us here probably don't understand what, what's involved and how you are exposed or to sort of the possibilities of discrimination and abuse and exploitation. The thing that's really terrifying is that you end up feeling very much, uh, very isolated. Um, like I said, when you have, um, the unions in general don't really want to protect you to a, after a certain point. Um, they want it to be the employer's responsibility. Uh, and then the employers want it to be the union's responsibility. So what's been happening, at least what I was realizing over these last few years, is that it's part of why you know SAG or equity or whatever, they don't re they're not really stepping up in this moment because they still ultimately believe that it should be the employer's job. But for us, the actors involved, that employer is somebody we're working with you know, sometimes for two months or less. That, th those aren't people we feel safe talking to. They don't know who we are. They don't, they don't have a long-term interest in us. And then the unions, on the other mm -hmm. hand, for instance, the actors' unions, they can't really intervene if it's something between me and a director. Those are two different unions. They don't speak to each other. 
So suddenly there's nobody there for you. And what I feel like is uh, something that I, I feel is, um, doesn't get a lot of attention is the fact that most of the people that at least the stories that I know about, uh, the, the victims in that scenario told a lot of people. They weren't, it wasn't a situation where they were silent. They told a lot of people and there was actually nobody there to help them in the way they needed help because the sort of, there are all these loose ends everywhere. It's like this happened with a director so my union can't really do anything there and that job doesn't exist anymore so that production company doesn't exist anymore. There's nobody on the employer's end to help me. So where do I go? Then it becomes, do I tell my agent? I don't know, what's my agent gonna do? It, there really is a very isolating feeling and even what's supposed to happen on a lot of movie sets, for instance, is you're supposed to have a SAG sort of business representative on set, but that's not a person that I know. So if it's a situation where I'm supposed, I'm going to be like taking off my clothes or something, that person's presence doesn't necessarily make me feel safer. You end up feeling extremely isolated. And even if you can try to tell people what happened, those people can't really then do anything with that. So you, it ends up feeling, I think, for a lot of people that they did everything they could think of to do and there was no bigger system at play to, to sort of catch them um, or, or to address a bigger systemic issue. It sort of feels like there's so many systemic issues to get out here. <laughs> where do we even start? Is it within the unions? Is it within the culture at large? Is it, where, do we, where do we even go? So I think that's part of the, the problem that I think we're all facing and like in kind of the, the meetings that I'm in of you know, theater people or actors or whatever is where do we even start? Because there actually, there are so many smaller systems. How do we, how do we figure out a way to connect each other uh, so that we don't feel so alone? Um, Wendy? Yeah. Well, I was just gonna say call a lawyer, right? That's really the first person you should call a lawyer because um, you're not technically an employee and so you fall outside the scope of, of some civil rights laws. You're not in school, <clears throat> so you don't have those civil rights protections. But lawyers can think about lots of things they can do to make it stop. You know, all you have to do is threaten a lawsuit against one or the other of these responsible persons. And um, it's, a, it's oh, amazing me, how the threat. <laughs> but I did call a lawyer. That's how I and does worked it work? with this person. No, because in a lot of cases, what are you looking for here? And who's, first of all, I mean, if it's pro bono, that's great. I know in my situation, I couldn't find anybody that would help me pro bono. But even if I did, I wasn't looking for money and I wasn't looking for uh, anything particular other than for this individual. And I'd have a, a conversation. And in terms of mediation, for instance, which is why we suggested it, in my situation, they just said, I don't feel like it. And then you're kind of still, the issue is what do you want? And when you're calling a lawyer, you need to know what you want, yeah. at least in my experience. But, but I, I'm just saying that, that it's very important to recognize that some people are just not protected by civil rights laws. Where When we talk about things like sexual harassment, we have to remember that that is a term of art in law that really has nothing to do with human behavior. I don't like the phrase sexual harassment. I personally think it was devised to help insulate uh, businesses and schools from liability and exposure. And I'm going to hold you there for oh. a minute and I actually want Wendy to explain what the phrase sexual harassment means, where it came from, what it covers. Then I want to go a little back to Maureen but, and talk about, and with all of us, the inv how it's so easy to get exploited when you're invisible and not, when you don't have an organization to yeah. protect you. But let's wheel back a little bit and maybe have you explain or talk about the term sexual harassment and why you dislike it, Wendy. Oh yeah, and it's terrible, it's terrible to feel like it's a bad phrase when we all use it in a way that sounds like a good thing, right? We're gonna go talk about sexual harassment. The reason I dislike it is because it was created as a kind of substitute for what it really is, which is sex discrimination. And once you take it outside of that um, discursive framing, you forget that any form of violence against a woman is a form of discrimination. It's not, it, and when you call it sexual harassment, I think we stop thinking about it as a civil rights issue. Now, why does that matter? Because when we think about civil rights, we think about the collective. I'm obviously not black, but when I hear about a racist assault, I feel injured. Because civil rights laws were designed to create injury in the collective. That was the purpose of civil rights laws, that we would all feel injured. The individual black person feels injured, but we as members of his or her community feel injured too. That's what civil rights laws did that was so magical. But we 
don't use that language when we talk about violence against women, in part because we came up with this completely distracting term called sexual harassment, as if it's a special different thing. We need to call it sexual harassment because then when a single, and this goes to Byron's point, when a single sexual assault happens or a single sexually offensive thing happens, we don't think about it as her private problem. We think about it as our collective problem. And what does that mean for us? We all get more skin in the game, we get more involved, not because we want to help, not because we're bystanders. To me, the word bystander, uh, sorry to say this, the word bystander is a, separate, a separatist word. You're the bystander, I'm the victim. No, we need to be the same. And that's what civil rights laws do. Civil rights framing is critically important so that we all have skin in the game, we all feel injured, thus invested in the solution. We know that intuitively when we hear about racist assault. We do not feel it, know it, or talk about it when it involves sexual assault, even though they're the same thing. They are exactly the same thing under civil rights laws. Can I, can I just, Please. so um, one of the things that, you know, listening to you um, talk, Wendy, one of the things that Me Too did for me was made me think about the collective. It, it really did, because it was just day after day after day after day. And, and I've been doing this work for 25 years, and maybe I haven't thought about the collective in that way that I thought about what we as a society lose when there's nowhere for you to go. What we as a society lose in terms of cures for cancer and Parkinson's when half the population is constantly being discriminated against, right? It means that you're not actualizing your potential. It means that you are not being that person. Half the population, women, um, you know, it, it, it's demystified things a bit for me. It's like, yeah, it's really hard to be a surgeon if you're constantly being discriminated against sexually in the workplace. So I do think that Me Too had that kind of power, if we could harness it to do this, what you're suggesting, um, and talk about civil rights and talk about discrimination. I think this is a great, I love this. Thank you. So Maureen, you brought out this really important point, which is, I think, we maybe glossed over it a little bit. What if you know, you're in this situation and it's really unpleasant, but you want to continue working with that person for whatever your reasons are. Maybe you like the job, maybe you like the role, maybe it's personally good for you and you think it can be worked out. And that's a discussion we have very little of because we tend to be, um, in the society, we tend to address things in a sort of pugilistic way. We box the person. We say, enough, this is done. And if the person wants to stay, well, what's wrong with them? Why don't they want to prosecute? Right? And so there's not the possibility of discussion or mitigation or mediation. And I want to ask again a Byron. So I know, one of, how do you get men and boys to talk about violence and harassment without being defensive? Because that's really what you're saying. If we can get people to the table to admit and take accountability and responsibility, then we can go on to have them talk about things possibly non-defensively. Maybe not after they've harassed someone, but maybe before. Yeah. So um, this is very thought-provoking about it. The whole conversation is very thought-provoking. Um, you know, my experience is that typically, generally speaking, uh, boys and men do not want to be included in conversations about rape and sexual assault uh, and physical violence, battering, and those sort of things because they, do, they feel like they're being targeted and attacked unfairly um, if they themselves have not participated in such an act, right? So they feel as if uh, they as individuals are being held responsible as, a, you know, for, they're being held responsible um, for being a part of a collective group. And so um, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't really matter, like if, if, if young boys and men hear that they're gonna be having conversations about sexual violence, sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, misogyny, patriarchy, or any of those things, nine times out of 10, they're gonna, they're gonna check out before you even have the conversation because they feel as if they're being scapegoated somehow or they're being targeted somehow. And so I think one reason for that is because boys and men do not fully understand that these are issues that don't just affect girls and women, they also affect boys and men. Yeah. Even when um, boys and men are affected by sexual violence, it's usually perpetrated by other men, right? Not other women. And so we have to be able to shift the lens 
for a lot of young boys and men and older men, um, because this is, I mean, this <coughs> it goes beyond generation, um, to see clearly that this, these are issues that affect us too, as well as women. Not to diminish the, the role that women play or the significance that women play in ending uh, this, this, this problem, but I think it's really important to get boys and men to clearly understand that if we all, if we all have, and again, I, I hate to kind of put it in this, in this way, but um, to be quite honest with you, this is the most effective way that I have found uh, to be able to reach boys and men is by talking about the women in their lives, right? Talking about their daughters, talking about their mothers, talking about their sisters, their grandmothers, their female friends, and all of those different things, but humanizing women, human, humanizing women in ways where so many boys and men culturally have dehumanized women and devalued women to the point when, when they hear about sexual violence, when they hear about a rape, when they hear about a woman who was, you know, um, uh, you know, raped in the workplace, they tend to disconnect from it and say, well, I don't know her. She's just some random woman. You know, we have to get to the point where boys and men are understanding that the woman who was violated is a human being who was, whose human rights were violated, right? And so the, 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 main, the main idea I think that we have to get across to boys and men is that women are human. Women who are, are, who are victimized by rape and sexual assault are human just like your mother is human, just like your sister is human, just like your, you know, uh, and it's, it sounds like so basic to have to say that, but I've had thousands and thousands and thousands of conversations where so many boys and men have not made that connection. They just don't make the connection. And it's because they haven't been forced to make the connection. They haven't been, they've been poorly educated. They operate with myths and stereotypes about girls and women in, in ways that benefit them, in ways that allow them to have the kind of power and privilege to take advantage of, of, of girls and women in so many different ways. So I'm sorry for going, you know, I'm sorry for going on and on. But You're I, not. Huh? You're not going okay, on sorry. and on. The fun, can I just say one quick thing? So the funny thing is what Byron's describing is constitutional subjugation of women. Men in this country are raised under a regime that teaches them from birth that they are superior and supreme because women are not equal. That's what they learn from day one. Well, you just said that so much better than I did. No, <laughs> but the reason I mention this is because I've tried to say this on my Twitter handle so many times. I just try to say this as simply as I can. It's, it's a little abstract mm -hmm. to talk about how constitutional superiority gives you that sense. And, and I talk about it as how it's connected to the entitlement. This yes. notion of entitlement is highly correlated with sexual violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of studies say if you feel a sense of entitlement, you will be more likely to commit sexual violence. So I talk about the critical importance of passing the ERA to take away that sense of entitlement and allow our boys to be raised as loving and equal rather yes. than entitled and then violent when entitlements are denied. My girlfriend left me, beat her up. Mm -hmm. She won't have sex with me, rape her. Yeah. That's where rape comes from, the loss of your entitlement. Now you say that to a guy, oh, well, we're gonna take away your entitlement by giving women equality. That sounds like a loss. If exactly. you frame it as, no, 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 it's not a loss. It's a gift. <laughs> it's a gift to you as a male to be raised in a culture that wants you to be loving. What a gift. And I, and I just want to, I want to follow up your point by saying that I feel as if I have been gifted by learning so much about these issues and by deconstructing manhood and masculinity and patriarchy. And I'm talking about on a personal level. Okay, so there was a Byron who existed before I learned about gender issues and before I learned about sexual violence and physical abuse and patriarchy and misogyny. And then it was a Byron, there's a Byron who exists today who is very different than the old Byron, and my life has benefited greatly um, from being able to remove or eliminate the performance of masculinity that, that, it, that correlates with this sort of subjugation of girls and women that I was a part of, that I participated in, that I was complicit you know, in, in terms of like how I operated within male culture. So your point is a very brilliant one, 
an astute one, and it's actually factually true because I am, I can say myself. Exhibit A. And I'm not saying that to put myself on a pedestal. I'm saying it hopefully as a way to provide an example for what's possible, right? Because I didn't grow, I didn't, I didn't take gender studies classes, you know, when I was in college. I, did, I grew up an athlete. I grew up a jock, typical jock, right? But through education and through hearing um, stories about girls and women who are being raped and sexually assaulted, and then seeing the level of ignorance and lack of awareness that so many of us men have, it helped me to basically humble myself enough to see that this is a real problem that we have in our culture and it needs to be addressed because real women and real women's lives are being adversely affected by mostly men. And so that's, that's why all of this is important. That's why we have to have these conversations. Yes. We're doing very, very well on time, which is amazing. And um, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to um, turn over, invite the audience to ask us questions so we can have a leisurely discussion. I was afraid it was going to be rushed. And if we have more time, then we can do more things. But um, I think there's a microphone that's going around. Just put up your hands. We'll bring the microphone to you. And if you want a specific person to answer it, let us know. Thank you. I have several questions, but I'll start with Start one. with one, please. <laughs> Uh, this is a subject that I'm really passionate about, and um, my first question is, as I observe everything that is going on with Me Too, uh, Time's Up, my feeling about all of that is that how do we teach women to love ourselves so that we can have control over what happens to us? Because until we know ourselves, we can say yes or no, that we know we have that right to, us, to assert that position of right and know that we can't compromise. And I feel that how we are raised, because most children are, women, are raised by women. How are we raising men who are abusive? What is it, is it part of it coming from us? What can we do different and better as we move forward that we don't have to look to the legal system alone to fix us, but that we can start within and as we grow and teach our children to do better. Because I feel like I'm around a lot of women, mothers, and I feel like a lot of that prejudice, discrimination, or however you want to phrase it, is coming from the women. And it comes from an inner self or lack of self-worth, lack of self-esteem, or how they were raised culturally. I attend a church where uh, sexual abuse or domestic abuse is not frowned upon. It's almost... Well, that's part of the culture. That's part of the, so how do you take that away when a child goes to church, a boy, a girl goes to church where the pastor to whom they look to is telling them that it's part of the culture. Get well, a different church. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we begin to love ourselves? How do we begin to re, basically re-educate women in general? That Because there, there are times where we won't be able to uh, go to the legal system or be able to find someone else to fight for us, but that we can stand on our own and that it becomes a part of us. And we don't have to look to people, but that we as women, we can stand and be and know that we can say yes, we can say no, and that that should be enough. Mm -hmm. Who'd like to, t <clears throat> great series of questions that you packed there. <laughs> Who'd like to answer that? I have a, I mean, your question is complicated, right? Because um, while we can empower women, we can't, we can't keep things from happening to them necessarily just by empowering them, right? Because perpetrators are perpetrators. But I teach a sex and culture class here at John Jay. Many of my students are here. Thank you for coming, guys. Um, and uh, one of the things that I like to talk about is, is, is teaching our daughters how to take care and take charge of their sexual selves. Letting girls know that they are entitled to their sexuality. They are entitled to have sex. There is nothing wrong with being a girl who has sex. And I think that that is somewhere I, I start in my own house with my children, um, my son and my daughter, letting girls know. And I, I this is a kind of a novel idea, I think, as I look around, even with my own friends and my family, um, people are not telling girls that they're allowed to have sex and that they, it's their body 
and they can enjoy it. And I think that that might be a start. I don't know how that'll go over in church, but. <laughs> Anyone else? I think there's a problem when you um, raise your children to feel and, and be empowered, and they confront um, punishments and sanctions for doing exactly that. I mean, my daughter, uh, one of my kids was in second grade. One of her kids asked, you know, what your mother did for a job, and my, she said she um, is a lawyer who helps children who get abused. And the girl said, well, what does abused mean? And my daughter said, well, you know, like sexual abuse, if someone puts their finger in your vagina. And, um, <laughs> and my daughter got called to the office and sanctioned. And I was livid. I was livid. What, why would you make my daughter feel bad for telling people a very real thing about what I do, number one, and what happens to kids sometimes, number two? So I think it's a problem only in the sense that I know, you, I know you said, well, assume we can't fix these systems. Can we just be strong in ourselves? Look, you know, slaves in the South were very strong. And they were living in conditions where that strength probably allowed them to, to survive. But I don't accept, and I hope you don't take offense to this, I don't accept that becoming strong within oneself is good enough. I think you have to hold your government accountable. And if you feel strength, and if you want to feel that strength become actualized, you should use your voice to demand equality from your government. Fight for the ERA. Fight for equality, because nothing else matters. Equality first, and a lot of other things will come. Otherwise, you're just pushing crumbs around on a half-empty plate. And yes, you might feel strong in your own self, but it's an elusive strength because it has no reality in your culture. I, I really feel like people should but put all their eggs in this basket of equality and watch the world get better. Thank you. Any, would you step Yeah, I have a quick thought. This isn't entirely related to my work as a journalist, but just thinking about what you just said, I feel like we have like a fundamental sex education problem in this country. And I was thinking about it with what both of you just said. Like I was, I was reading a piece. Um, it was actually a piece about pornography in the New York Times, but there's a section sort of about sex ed. And like the majority of schools in this country, like maybe you have like that, uh, like one quick like lesson, and like kids don't learn basic anatomy or about female pleasure. And there's like, to me, that's insane. I was raised by a German woman who did not have those cultural expectations and, and it was completely normal in Germany if you're a teenager that you're gonna have sex and you talk about you know being safe and you talk about all these things but like the idea that we would hide children from this that we would punish a child for saying the word vagina is insane to me and so maybe one thing you can do as a parent is like go you know go to your schools and try to push for better sex ed I don't know I don't know if that'll fix it but that might definitely help. Can I, can I say something really quick? Or do we not Please, have you, don't, you do not have to say okay, it quickly, so, but... Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, all right? And I'm sure that you all will. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I, I, from, from everything that I understand, um, you know, patriarchy is, is, is so pervasive and so um, omnipresent that, you know, girls and women internalize sexism in many of the ways that black people internalize racism, right? And, and racial oppression. And I think that um, first we have to recognize that and we have to recognize when we've actually internalized um, a set of values and ideas that do not work for us, right? That work against us. And I think that once we can really sort of recognize that, th then we can begin to start to change our uh, sort of uh, our value system that are in a way that's in alignment with who we really are, right, and how we really feel. And then the other thing is I think that, you know, unfortunately, um, the church is, is a location, it's a source um, that, that reinforces a lot of this, the same sort of patriarchy and sexism um, from, from a lot of men in positions of power within <coughs> churches. So I don't think that the, the church is, a, is a, a, I don't think that many churches are good locations um, to receive uh, an education about, um, about sex and sexuality. I just don't think that they're good locations for that. Um, so we, you have to figure out and find other churches that may be a little bit more progressive, not as oppressive, or figure out another form of spirituality that, that empowers you. Um, 
and then the last thing that I would say is that there are so many um, like black women writers and authors who are writing about um, sexism in the African American community, from Joan Morgan to um, Tamara Lomax to you know you probably know many of them yourselves. You know, Bell Hooks. You know, Patricia Hill Collins. I mean, there's so many women of color who are writing about these ways, these things in very thoughtful ways. And I think that young girls um, should have as much, much exposure to these women as humanly possible. No. Uh, and that, that transcends race. Mm. Thank you. And, and young boys. Uh, <laughs> and young boys, yes. <laughs> Go ahead, there's a question. Oh, yeah. oh. Um, well, I had so many questions, but all of them got changed by everybody responding. Um, I, I just want to say that uh, it has to do with the foundation of the Constitution. Um, Rosa Park, she went to the front of the bus. She did what she had to do. But you know what? I'm a blue-eyed person. I have different skin color. But DNA-wise, you can't tell the difference 2,000 years from now. That goes to the uh, anthropologist somewhere over there. <laughs> um, so what I'm saying is that the ERA is important. It's very important. That's the foundation of our Constitution. We have to be equal in the Constitution. Now, I was going to start with um, my son being 13-year-old uh, watching uh, what is it, the shape of color, no, What's shape of water, shape? whatever it was. Yeah. And he saw the movie totally different. He saw it as people falling in love with each other no matter what they are. I'm like, oh, is that what it's about? <laughs> I was so scared about the sex scenes. And, you know, well, she's taking her clothes off because she's showing that she's a human species, you know. Uh, so you see how deep just the human body is. And I'm a doctor. Um, and I was so happy to watch this movie with my son because he looked at it as an equal rights type of movie, which would never <laughs> occur to me about you could fall in love with anybody, See mommy. Monsters equality. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let's go. And then I, you know, I can go to each of the panelists and ask such a deep question from my children's point of view, but, but we don't have all night. But <laughs> I, I can only say that um, <coughs> We need the Equal Rights Amendment. Rosa Park did not sit in that bus for nothing. I'm white, you are a different skin color, and we do not have equal rights in our Constitution. Thank you. Thank you. More questions from the floor. Come on, students. If you're scared, this is the time to do it. If you think you'll make a dumb remark, make it. You'll be amazed how liberating it'll feel. Come on, don't I make us feel bad now. There we go. Uh -huh. Next person. <laughs> we, we don't forgive professors for dumb remarks, Dr. Willock. Um, I think um, it's very true about patrimony and privilege, but um, but also I think both men and women suffer from uh, being socialized into uh, stereotypical <laughs> sex roles um, where, uh, let's say, if you're uh, a man and you don't fill uh, some kind of a stereotyped image of being super macho, or you're a woman and you don't fill into some kind of a uh, uh, seductive sexual image, uh, it causes a lot of suffering and uh, pain and nobody's really happy and it denies everybody's humanity on a deeper level. And so um, how do we deal with uh, being able to uh, undergo change in that area uh, beyond uh, 
the uh, political movement for uh, equal uh, rights and a constitutional amendment? Great question. Well, I, I mean, I, <clears throat> I think um, stereotypes are the product of a culture that not only um, uh, grows its roots from that inequality, but also then uh, exploits <coughs> women's second class status to find ways of making money off of women, women's bodies, and so forth. So I think a lot of these stereotypes are normalized because uh, the sexualization of women is an extremely lucrative industry. Um, and men have to be brutish and manly in order to uh, be consumers of the sexualization of women. Um, I don't know what the current number is. It's like $150 billion a year, pornography, and then there's you know, sex trafficking. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just an enormous industry. So if we actually did have the humanity you're talking about, that industry would lose a lot of money. That's my first reaction. Um, but I also think that um, people are raised to feel uh, good because, uh, about even stereotypically bad ways of being because it's in their, it's in their core and it's comfortable. So you know, if your sense of, of how you are and who you are in the world is comfortable, it's hard to ask people to give some of that up. Mm -hmm. Talk, um, talking about making people uncomfortable, uh, you know, um, comfortable with discomfort is a big ask. It's a very big ask. I try to do it all the time, but my style, you will not be surprised to hear, is rather um, aggressive. So, <laughs> you know, I will just make people uncomfortable and then hope it produces a conversation that, that then moves us. Um, I recently did a survey of uh, some of the high school girls in my town, and I asked them questions about their relationships with boys, and the stories they told me were unreal. They were, in a nutshell, things like, well, the boys determine whether the girls are popular by who gives blowjobs. The, the boys will choose who they want to hook up with on the weekend, and um, you know, if you do what they ask, you get to be one of the popular girls, because the boys controlled who the, who, what popularity meant. And I mean, the list of things they told me I, was so stunning, and um, I turned it, so I, I'm a regular columnist, I turned it into a column. And I submitted it to my regular local paper, which is a hard copy paper, and they were very excited. Oh, we're gonna run, and I also included things like, they only put, uh, the girl athletes are a lot better than our crappy football team, but the, only the football team gets individual name signs put in the middle of the road to celebrate them because they're the football team. I don't think they won one game in the past five years. The girls are like state champions. They never get their own name signs. So I put that sort of stuff in there, and I could go on. The point is that I, all I did was write what I heard. My, no, my local paper was excited about writing it. Then they changed their mind, and they said, we can't run this because you don't have data. And I'm like, Freak you, data? What are you talking about data? There's my, those are answers of real humans. That's data. Mm -hmm. You want me to do a research study, double blind? <laughs> so um, I was very angry. Um, and then I sent the, before I even submitted the piece, I sent it for a copy to the superintendent and the principal. And I said, if there's anything in here you'd like to respond to, I give you all the ink you want. I will put your answers in my, my piece. And they ignored me, ignored me, ignored me, and then said, we'd rather you not run it, it lacks data. Turns out that's where the data point came from with, uh, with regard to the paper. So I sent it to our only other publication, which was an online second class publication. And of course, he was willing to run it. And all, the reason I'm telling you this story is, even just this little crappy online local publication blew my town up into this unbelievable war. Who's on Wendy's side? Who's on the football <laughs> team side? It turned into an enormous, an enormous fight with the school being angry and the you know, superintendent being angry. And my point is, and I just say this because you know, I think you have to do these sort of things. I knew it was gonna piss them off. I knew what I was doing because I know the politics of that issue in that school very well. I have five kids, they've all been there. I know about the blowjobs under the seat. You know, I know it. So I did it on purpose <clears throat> because no one else was giving visibility to this problem. 
It was hard to do because nobody, you know, was, the, the regular newspaper wasn't encouraging me to do it. It was just this online thing. And then at the end of the day, at the end of the day, because I put it in print, the girls started talking about it. The boys started talking about it. The superintendent, you know, created like a group to have a meeting about it. And now they're having an event in April and I'm actually an invited speaker. Figure that out. Well, but what I'm saying is- They don't is, want you to write another article, They really don't Wendy. want me there at all. No, but because I put it in writing and made it public, the school would have liability exposure because now the people at the top know about the problem. And if they don't do something about discrimination that they know about at the highest levels, they can be sued, they can face state complaints under you know discrimination laws, they can face federal complaints, so they now have to act. I tell you that story because that's how you agitate. I didn't do anything wrong, but that's how you agitate in one very simple way, giving voice, agitating, and provoking a tiny ripple of change that who knows where it could go. You know, I really encourage those kinds of things to affect how people feel about each other because you're right, you can't start at the top. I want the ERA to be passed. In the meantime, though, agitation at the grassroots is, you know, you bubble up, you, you bring these, you, you go up to the Supreme Court, you know, you fight for the ERA and you bubble up from the bottom and hopefully you meet at equality. Wonderful. I, <coughs> did you oh yeah, I just wanted to say a, a couple things. Um, one thing in terms of the sort of cultural changes uh, that I do feel um, I have a hair of optimism about is that you know, some of the people who have been removed from their positions, as we've seen, are, are sort of curators of a lot of the stories that then we internalize. So something that I am feeling um, curious, <laughs> mildly hopeful and curious about is the sort of, as the new waves of sort of these, these pieces of content, movies and TV shows that we all share these same vocabularies and how those things then get changed over the next few generations because different people are now the ones making those decisions creatively. And those kinds of things that we share as a cultural vocabulary make a big difference. So I'm, I'm interested in to see how that starts to change the kind of larger vocabulary that we all are participating in culturally. But I do want to say also, in regards to this question and then the, the other question a little bit is, I also, I've, I've absolutely experienced in some of the more chilling experiences I've had that women were the ones uh, that I, were the more adversarial people that I dealt with and when I needed help. And realizing how deep that um, these gender roles are internalized uh, ha has been scary to me, uh, to say the least. And I, I think that making choices the way we have to make in order to stand up for what we believe in and agitate, I, I do think that, you know, it, it, will, it feels like loss. It feels like a loss when you do that, when you remove yourself from a community or a church or a group of people that you're used to spending time with. Um, people, when you, when you realize how deeply sometimes that happens, and you may try to have conversations and decide ultimately you have to remove yourself from that, or if you're trying to change a, a situation, like, okay, this, this is a, now a group of people that doesn't feel like they're gonna be able to grow with me in the way I want to grow, and that, I think that, that is something that can't be um, kind of underestimated is how uh, profound a loss that can feel when you are willing to agitate or stand up for something, and if you might not always feel like you have uh, people around you when you need to do that. And that's something to be prepared for, I think. And that it's still, um, there will be a community. You will, I think, to trust in that. There will be a community that, that you will find. It may feel scary at first when you're doing those things, but that, that does kind of arise around you, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where does education fit into this model? I mean, I understand the agitation portion of it, but then you must rise to the occasion with some level of education. So where does that fit into the model? Who'd like to answer that? I'll take a stab at it, but I don't know how comprehensive I can be. Um, well, you know, that's, that's one thing that I, I'm, I'm proud to say that I was a part of in working with a program called the Mentors and Violence Prevention Program um, is that it, it was, the program was designed to institutionalize um, conversations um, and a curriculum about gender violence prevention, including sexual violence. Um, so I, I'm a strong believer that um, 
that type of education needs to take place at the earliest levels possible. Um, and it needs to be sort of um, co-signed and endorsed by people in positions of leadership who believe in that kind of education so that you can slowly begin to um, change the culture you know, in, in significant ways. Um, so I, I think, I think you know, just like media literacy is important, you know, that, that and, and never really gets taught um, at every single level within our educational system, I think that gender violence prevention um, programs and curriculums need to be implemented throughout the United States. We have with us today Hannah Pennington from the mayor's office, and I know they do a ton of work on education, um, so Hannah's going to take... <clears throat> Hi everyone, I'm so, so happy to be here. I came here to see the exhibit first and foremost, but of course had to stay once I really understood what this panel was about and I'm thrilled to hear from all of you. Um, I oversee policy and training for the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence and I couldn't agree more with what Byron is saying and we are working <coughs> as hard as we can with leadership at the Department of Education, for example, but throughout systems in New York City at the college level, and you're absolutely right, even in pre-K, we're training social workers around these issues and trying every day to do more and more, but with 1.1 million children to educate generally, it's we come up against barriers all the time. And one that I wanted to bring up, which I think is important for this kind of gathering, is that I always say to the teams that I work with that we have to keep trying to make sure that leadership, you know, that the chancellor, that the superintendents, take this seriously and understand, for example, that sex education is so done poorly, and they say that openly and publicly, and I work for the city, I can tell you. I sit on the mayor's uh, task force on sex education. There's decades, eons of work to be done. But I also think that we have to be thinking about how we talk about it in our communities and how to, sh to show us part about point about parents and being able to have these conversations because we can't at a scalable level make every school make these kinds of cultural changes unless parents and teachers and community members and church leaders come together because we don't have that kind of control over communities and so I do think it's exciting to think about how we can support school communities in doing this and I agree with the agitation part but I also think we have to think about how and even support fi financially, even providing the spaces to have the conversations because it has to be system-wide, but then each school has to be able to have a space where, because honestly, I go around and I talk and people always say, oh, well, we can't, we can't do human trafficking and sex education because actually sex education, you need parents' permission. I'm like, actually, that's wrong. But this is people who know a lot about this work, so it, it, people are very uncomfortable with it, so we have to give people, we, we have to make them feel uncomfortable, but we also have to provide support to have the conversations because it's, so it's, we need top down and bottom up as well. That was all I wanted to say. Can I, can I say one quick thing in response to that? I think one of the things education um, could use <laughs> is a centralization of what civil rights laws mean. So it's, there's a lot of separating out of sex-based harm and, uh, and subjugation of sex-based harm. And it gets second-class treatment. New York has terrible sexual violence laws. They are just crap, absolute crap. That's why Harvey Weinstein isn't being prosecuted. That and the fact that he donated a ton of money to Cy Vance, but I digress. I'm not him, but you know, I, it, look, there's a lot of problems with Harvey Weinstein's prosecution in this um, state and my, personal opinion about prosecutors is if you don't like what your prosecutor is doing and you keep voting for them, that's your fault. If you got a prosecutor who is refusing to file charges disproportionately in violence against women cases, vote him out. Vote him out and then choose someone who says, I will tell you the truth about all the cases that come to my office. I will not discount violence against women. I will not drop domestic violence cases when the victim says, I don't feel like testifying, when in fact the real reason is the guy threatened to kill her if mm -hmm. she testified. You don't yeah. indulge that. Yeah. That's obstruction of justice, intimidation of a witness. Prosecute him doubly for threatening her. <laughs> I'm not saying prosecution is the only response, but if it isn't done fairly, then you've set up a system of justice that actually produces violence. Justice is a core idea around which societies are organized. When you message that violence against women is not serious, and women, you're really saying women's lives are worth 
crap. They're not worth very much. So prosecutors who send that message need to get voted out. And by the way, I'm not saying Cy Vance should prosecute Weinstein, although I think he should. But <laughs> I, no, but I, what I am saying is, why is it such a difficult decision? And the answer is, your laws stink. Rape requires proof of force in New York. Most enlightened states that, claim, that actually care about human rights and women's rights and civil rights, they don't require proof of force in addition to non-consent. They say, if you, if you rape my body, if you touch my body, penetrate my body without my consent, that's a crime. And if you also use force, it's a worse crime. That's like taking my stuff. You take my money without force, it's larceny. You also use force, it's robbery. Women are supposed to be more important than stuff, but they're not. They're not, because it's not a crime in New York and many states, including my god-awful Massachusetts. <laughs> it's a terrible thing that we protect stuff better than women. If we cared about women's autonomy, authority over their bodies, freedom to decide who touches them, it would be a crime in New York to touch a woman without her consent. And it is not. It is not. It's a misdemeanor like if you grab someone's rear end on the tee. But I'm talking about the kind of rapes that we all care the most about. If, there's, if force isn't used, it's not a crime. That's like saying all non-consensual sexual penetration of women is legal. How do you all live in a state where that's what your lawmakers have done to you? Why is that not, a, why are you not marching in the streets? That's what you should be doing. This is a terrible state for violence against women, terrible. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. La last question, and then if, please, on your way out, grab some more wine and then ask the panelists more questions, but off mic. We were supposed to run around 7.30ish, but there's... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. So I have one more comment. Mm -hmm. um, I do agree with everything you're saying, but I'd like to think I know a little bit more. I've been to these panels. I've heard more people. But when you're dealing with people, for, I'm from a different community. Um, and when we're dealing with people from these different communities, I believe they need to be, ed women from these different communities need to be educated. Like people in this room are aware of what's going on. They're aware of what, what their rights are, or where to resources that are available to them. But when you are raising a culture where you've been taught that women are less than. Or, so how do you demand those rights? How do you promote ERA? How do you do all these things? And that's what I'm saying, that people such as ourselves need to educate women better, or little girls that are growing up in these environments, that they know that they have the right to their bodies. They can say yes, where I can say yes if I want to sleep with someone. I don't have to be ashamed of that. And I can say no just as well, and I don't have to be ashamed, be afraid to say no. But that requires education, because in this setting, we're safe. We know our rights, we're educated, we know better. But when you step out of this environment, it's not the same. And that's what I'm speaking to education. How do we teach women? How do we empower them with that education, with that knowledge? Yes, there we can vote. We can move remove people from office we, this is the this is what we're supposed to be entitled to but if you don't know if you're not trained if you're taught like your wife you're born to be a wife to raise babies and do all that stuff how do you demand those rights that you speak of and i think that's where we have to start at the very bottom in many communities because everything what we have here is not what we have in many communities not the community that I'm from. And I think these women are also entitled to these rights. And they're raising little girls yep. who are becoming product of that environment where someone can touch you that you don't know it's wrong, that you're ashamed to have sex, you're afraid to even speak of sex. So how do you say, how do you go tell your parents someone touch you when you're afraid to even mention the word sex? to mention penis, to say, no, I can't have sex, that as a girl, I have the right to have sex. I try to have this conversation. You can have sex. I, if I want to have sex, yes, I'll say yes. If I don't want to have sex, I can say no. But you have to be comfortable to speak that way, to know what your rights are. And that requires education. And that's why we can't assume that people know these things. 
because this is New York City, this is the United States, and cultures are different, religions are different, and that's part of our duties as we go, as we move forward with these movements or trying to get whatever laws pass. If you don't know you're entitled to these rights, you won't vote for them. Why didn't, help, why didn't we vote for a woman? Why are we still here? Where have the population? What are our thoughts? Why are we here? Why are we not where we can be? It's part of what's been internalized in our minds, in our culture, in our environment that's keeping us behind. We're self-hating. That's what I've encountered in my culture, yeah. in my community. And I think that's what we have to work on to move forward. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you all so much for coming, for staying, for asking, for listening. Um, thank you.